Hello ladies, welcome to Homemakers Radio. I hope that you are doing well in your present circumstances, but that you have great plans for its improvement. I am here to help you, just to entertain you a little bit and read to you some things that have had an influence on me. Maybe they will have an influence on you while entertaining you so that you can get something done. It's always nice to have something to listen to. Lately I have my secret indulgences, which are not so secret, but I listen to books on tape and audiobooks that I am of sub various subjects that I'm interested in. <clears throat> Now, those of you who have been here for a while know that you need to um, click the subscribe button on the YouTube channel and also uh, ring the bell so that you'll be notified. And you can come back here to my blog and you can leave comments here. And this, these videos are just designed to go with what I am going to write about on the blog. And there will be other things on there and other descriptions of things I have spoken of. The first thing that I have done is divided these little speeches into three sections and one is preparation, the other is homemaking, and the other is dealing with people and various other things. And lately I've been reading a little bit about people of the past and how they managed their lives and these are things we need to know about because we didn't just come out of nowhere. Every one of you is related to someone in the past. You're related to uh, everybody's related to a Victorian woman and man and I, I am astonished sometimes at moderns um, hatred and vilification of the Victorian era because they all got great-great-grandmothers or great-great-great-grandmothers of that era. I had a great-grandmother, a great-great-grandmother and some of us know who they were and we cannot disparage that era because we were not there and we do not know how it is they came to be the way they were or what they practiced. Now for the appearance part of this I think it's very important to to get dressed and be ready as though someone was going to come to the door just even if no one shows up. I know there are a lot of temptations in the home for a homemaker to say no one's going to see me today and for many of us that live in rural areas we don't go down to the shops in the morning like so many people do when they live in suburbia when you live out on land you're careful about uh, choosing your day that you go out and so every day I think it's very important to get dressed anyway even if no one quote will see you it is just a matter of personal dignity and that way you're not caught off guard if for instance you do have to go somewhere or someone is coming but you do have a family hopefully or you do have someone else in the home that you have to dress for if you are a caregiver I have a friend who's a caregiver and she will tell you that it's very important for you to dress up and look nice because it's like delivering flowers to uh, an invalid if you're a caregiver, you have to, you are their, uh, your light, their light, their, their brightness in the home. And this helps a lot for people who have, who have illnesses or who have chronic illnesses in the home. If the homemaker will dress up and if you wear an apron, make sure it's clean. We used to have one for every day back in the 1950s. People would embroidery aprons and they would say what day of the week it was and what they were doing and I think it's very important to dress up, to have a clean apron, and to approach the home as though it is just the most important, beautiful, sparkling castle you've ever known. And so we are going into winter now here. It's taking its time. The leaves have not fallen from the trees yet, but it's still cold. And I got to thinking about how exciting spring and summer are because all the things that you get out for preparation for that. You get out your lemonade glasses, you get out your uh, your summer clothes, and the, and the ladies' clothes always have uh, beautiful pastels and flowers on them and bright things. And when winter comes, we don't have that. Mostly our clothes are quite dark, and I was thinking how nice it would be to find some good cloth, heavy cloth like wool or corduroy, with the florals on it because I talked to you about flowers in the last video 
how important it would be to have, more important maybe, to have flowers in the winter. So we should dress in a bright, and maybe if you wear florals, wear them in the winter too. One way that I have taken my summer dresses and made them into winter is that I, this, this dress for example is cotton, it's lovely and cool, it's short sleeved, but in the winter I can wear a heavy skirt under it or over it and turn it into a blouse and I'm still wearing something pretty. Or I can wear a, uh, a t-shirt under it and I can make this quite warm and all of my dresses I can wear over uh, leggings and a, and a winter skirt, a black skirt, anything and still be very warm and still you know extend my summer wardrobe if I'm not ready to give up the the florals and the prettiness of it. Now we all uh, need self-control in running our homes. In running ourselves we need self-control and that's why I suggest that you give yourself some appointments with yourself. You go, uh, you have appointments and you go find your, your little exercise class online if, it, if you can find one and you go and find your um, your other things and you say okay now I'm going to go and uh, to my appointment my library appointment my uh, my office appointment I'm going to write my letter and you make appointments for yourself and that way you have some structure and the problem is ladies sometimes at home if you have come from institutions from the time you were real little it's very very hard to be self-motivated and self-controlled and self-employed but the self-employed man learned a long time ago there was a book out called uh, Dress for Success uh, back in the 70s I believe by J.T. Malloy and he was talking about men working at home and how they needed to uh, dress up and wear a button-down shirt and make appointments and stick to uh, some kind of a, a schedule that they self-imposed and it's very hard because we've all grown up especially us from the 1950s with someone telling us what to do and uh, it's like riding a a train it stops when it's supposed to stop and then it starts somewhere else and and you're on this uh, ride and someone else is controlling it but when you're a homemaker you have to be self-controlled and that's why I suggested making a list and then obeying it <laughs> And I, I'm the worst for not obeying myself because I will put stuff on here that I have to be done, but they don't interest me. And I'm very artistic, and there are some things I would rather do than other things. But the other day I decided I was going to put myself to the test, and I was going to obey myself. So I made a list of things that had to be done. Instead of waiting around for someone else to take care of it, I decided to go do it myself. And the immense satisfaction that followed was certainly worth it, and it builds you up in character. And so self-control is one of the character qualities that the Bible mentions. And the way to get it is to do things that uh, you don't want to do, and, and to make yourself do things. And uh, a young mother with little children learns it because she's got to get up whether she likes it or not. When the child is crying in the night or needs her or has or is sick, she puts aside the things that she really wants to do in order to do her responsibility and her duty. Now that is hard to explain and you can uh, investigate it further and put yourself to the test by making a list for your home, for the homemaking. And I would suggest you start by first of all getting all dolled up if that's what you do putting your apron on and getting started you might go watch some of the um, channels where ladies have decided they have chosen a certain era to live in and they dress like that and they buy appliances like that and then they have a routine a daily routine just to get an idea of what people used to do and and get into it especially if you have not grown up with a uh, a family that where the mother stayed home and uh, of course I grew up in an era where I cannot even think of anyone who didn't stay home a mother a woman that didn't stay home there was one woman who brought the mail out when her husband was sick because he had the mail job and there was another woman who drove the school bus when her husband was sick uh, because that was his job but that was back in the olden days and but they didn't want those jobs. They just did them when they had to. 
And so for someone to take care of us, I think if you've grown up in institutions, you, you think someone's going to take care of things and someone's going to take care of you. But you learn as you realize that self-control equals freedom. If someone's taking care of you all the time and you have everything done for you, you also are not as free. For example, if you have uh, appointments for everything with everybody else that is taking care of you, you've got someone taking care of your hair, you've got someone taking care of your uh, your nails, you've got someone taking care of your clothes, you've got to go out and get them made by someone else, you've got someone um, taking care of your health, you've got someone taking care of, you've got, a, when you think of all the appointments that you, that you may make, someone else is is taking care of you well that's kind of nice but what if that all fails what if they're not there you're going to have to learn to be self-employed and self-controlled in order to do it you don't just let things go and uh, this can be uh, illustrated perhaps by stories we used to read in uh, old old books. I don't know if you can find them anymore, but after a war, sometimes the uh, monarchies of different countries were were deposed and people would immigrate to uh, New York. And these people did not know how to get along because everything had been taken care of for them. So they had to learn uh, their way around. They had to learn to work. And stories were told of people who were absolutely useless at e even cleaning up anything uh, and you could go into their apartments and uh, there was such a mess because they didn't have their their help with them and uh, but generally people learn had to learn to make their way in life after that so you at home have a wonderful opportunity to, to be self-employed if you had to if you start to run your own life then uh, you'll be looked upon as someone who has some wisdom. Now, uh, I'm going to bring several things into this talk today because of the home. I want to talk about the home. And uh, you have your way of doing things, but what is the most important thing to you? Most important thing to me is that when someone enters the house, including myself, when I come in from getting the mail, I walk down the road and get the mail when I come in, I want to come into something that makes me happy. So when you open the door, the first thing I want to see uh, is a cleared table or a couch where the pillows are poofed and everything's smoothed out. And of course, we're going to mess it up every day, but that is why God lets us do that, so that we'll have something to do every day. And uh, but what is the most important thing to you? The second thing I think would be, or maybe the first thing would be the scent or the smell. Because I uh, have had children, and I think God makes mother's um, senses more keen. And we can smell things. We know when there's something that needs to be cleaned up. And uh, so that that's what I would work on first. Is the I've told you this before, the wet areas of the house, the bathroom, the kitchen, the laundry room. And keep those all clean and smelling nice without modern detergents and uh scents and plugs plug-ins and things like that they smelled good when i was really young but as i've gotten older uh i've just been overwhelmed with it they make my eyes water um uh, they stuff up my nose they make me uh cough and i can't breathe and so i have had to do without most scents except occasionally i have a little collection of essential oils but of course those have to be uh, used carefully, they have to be watered down, and they have to be used with uh, carrier oils and things like that. You have to know something about it if you want a scent. But to me, uh, when I was growing up, the best scent we had was to peel an orange and just let it let the peels sit there for a while. Or um, and and other things, my mother's cinnamon rolls, things like that. We had natural things that scented the home, or a bouquet of fresh wildflowers. And or an indoor plant. These things scented the home. And uh, the other thing is to clean with natural things. And I don't really like the commercial quote natural things because when you read the ingredients they're the same. But uh, you can do your own research on it. And I want to read out of Linda Lichter's book Simple Social Graces 
it's about um, how this woman went into history to find out about how the Victorian people lived, particularly the women, because she'd been told over her lifetime and by the newspapers, and she worked for a newspaper, that the Victorian women were uh, downtrodden and underprivileged and that they didn't have any rights and that they, quote, had to stay home uh, and that they weren't allowed to have businesses and they weren't allowed to do this or do that or travel or anything like that. So she began to, uh, she wanted to prove it you know, she believed it, and she wanted to prove it, so she began to research and found out that just the opposite was true. Uh, in fact, they were more protected than uh, modern women. And uh, so I want to just read a chapter in here on her, how she did it, and I want to tell you how she did it. She got into their letters, she, uh, their their books, the authors. Unfortunately, in my opinion, and because I'm a sleuth, I believe, and a scientist, I believe that much of it has been destroyed and hidden from us because people from previous generation just uh, burned everything, burned down their houses, threw away all the letters and diaries, and there should be much, much more for us. There should be so much more, uh, but I believe some of it probably is hidden from us or put down in the basement of the... Uh, the Smithsonian or something, but Linda did find some books that were written by uh, some of the authors, in my opinion, were more modern than, but she did find enough that she could write this book, and so I'm going to read something about it because it had a, a table of contents that I found extremely interesting, and she found their diaries and also their inventions. You know that uh, the thing at the airport that you can hop on and it'll take you down to the length of the airport and you don't have to walk? Well, that was actually invented during Victorian times. And you can find an old video, black and white video, of people of Victorian times using it. You can find that on the YouTube and other places. Um, some of these things that we think we, that were invented in modern times were actually invented during their times. They invented the robots and there's museums of their inventions where you see uh, a robot uh, pouring a cup of tea and just they were just very very uh, intricate but she goes into uh, their okay what what their houses were like what their food was like what their clothing was like what their education was like what was their what were their hobbies like what was their industry like? What kind of work did they do? Um, what was their what were their games and their play like? What was it like? Uh, what was a daily life like? Uh, what were their relatives like? And um, what was their religion like? And what about their their home life? Like when they had problems with someone who who. Uh, through the family over. What, what was that like? What about their art and their poetry and their stories? Now, I thought I had found some when I got McGuffey readers, but there were several sets of McGuffey readers, and as it got more towards the 20th century, they were horrible. They just talked about scary things, things that children shouldn't be talking about, and uh, a lot of macabre things. So, uh, so you just still have to be careful. I thought maybe I had found some old Victorian things, but some of it was not. And then some of the magazines that I found, Victorian magazines, I'd get them at an antique store and think, oh, this is such a treasure, written in 1897. And I'd get it home, and it was just full of things you would not want uh, your daughter to read. And it was not, they, they were part good and part bad, just like any civilization. Also, what about the their celebrations. What kind of celebrations did they have? And what was their ma what were their manners like? So she wrote this book, Simple Social Graces, and I want to read to you uh, about the home. And then also I found an article about Jane Austen uh, about why the introductions, why when you read uh, Pride and Prejudice, um, what was Mrs. Bennett trying to get Mr. Bennett to go and see these young men. 
and uh, what it said, why it said it was so important to make a call on someone. So I'm going to read chapter 14, part of it. My time, I have to watch my time. Uh, so we'll go as far as we can, and then I'll read something else to you out of another book. You can go home again, it's called. What is a home these days? Now, if you've got something to do, I would hope that you would go and do it because there isn't anything to watch here. Um, it, you could sit there and analyze all the lines on my face and my um, frizzy hair, I guess, but uh, it won't do you much good. Be better just to listen and then go and find something to do, something to sort. A, you need a bookshelf to clean out. I'm really enjoying... Um, audiobooks because sometimes it takes five hours for someone to read them and that gives me plenty of time and I don't have to uh, go and find something else. I don't have to interrupt my work. Unfortunately this is only going to be an hour. So what is a home these days? Now I like it because she put uh, pictures, old pictures and it looks like some of the book, old books I have of the house plans of the 1800s in these houses and uh, there was a reason everything was placed where it was in a house and there was a reason things were built the way they were. It wasn't just to sell a house. Most homes I don't think were made to sell or resell. They were made for a person. They were made to the specifications of a person. They were, uh, it wasn't real estate in those days, I don't think, because I remember when my parents built a house in Alaska, it wasn't about real estate. That was their home. It was their forever home. What is a home these days? It's a place we go to find our space. Or is it a mail drop where we stash our stuff? A revolving door we rush through to change our clothes and rolls. Yeah, you remember the comedian? George Carlin, I think he said a uh, house is a place where you store your stuff while you go out and get more stuff. Isn't that sad? So, um, uh, so is it a revolving door we rush through to change our clothes and rolls? The Victorian concept of home, I always said, you know, people treat a home like it's a place you go while you get ready to go somewhere else or somewhere quote more important and everybody got up in the morning and and dashed through getting ready hardly had to think about it and uh, put a piece of toast in their mouth and, and got on the bus and went to school and just this horrid uh, rush as and as I say that I see a, a real school bus going past it's awfully early in the morning um, so the Victorian concept of home was so alien to the contemporary version, contemporary means current time, that we need a different language to describe it. Home was the very heart of 19th century culture. 19th century means 1800s. Uh, so the 20th century means the 1900s. Okay, The central icon for a national creed now, I am homeschooling some of you, so if you don't like it, you can just go on to something else. Actually, anything you listen to is homeschooling you if you're home and if it's your choice. And uh, I'm hoping to uh, equip you so you can take care of yourself, homeschool yourself, become self-employed at home, and organize your control yourself as the Bible teaches. It was the home was an emotional and aesthetic environment that provided the essential nutrients of family values, not just the box within which the parents preached them. So um, these family values, you hardly know what they are when you grow up in a public school or you're off to college because uh, you're so detached from them. You 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 really can go through many years without understanding it. And that's one thing that homeschooling can bring back to you if you decide to homeschool your family. It can bring back these family values. They'll come very gradually and then you'll notice, aha, we have a, a culture here. We have a home. We have a family. We're all relating to each other in a very rich and powerful way. You won't know it until you try it. Uh, it's not going to happen if everybody gets up in the morning and goes somewhere else unless they go together. Uh, to the same place. 
But it was also the home, a physical structure whose design and decor were infused with moral significance. So it wasn't, they built a house, but it wasn't just a place to go and sit around in. Every nook and cranny had a a reason, and it was all to develop this wonderful spiritual values, the, the, the wonderful spiritual value of home life. And it's hard to understand until you start to really get into it. And where it came home to me was homeschooling. And of course, I was brought up on a homestead in Alaska, and I had a little bit of it, uh, of the feeling of it from my parents, because both of them uh, were not institutionalized, but they had many skills. They could build a house, they could start a business. My father built boats uh, for a living and for himself. And he, and he was a fisherman, a commercial fisherman for a while. And uh, my mother could grow anything, big gardens, have and t- make tons of food. And so, in a way, I understood what it was like to be uninstitutionalized, um, even though I I had to learn it myself. The religion of home. The Victorians regarded the home as a kind of sacrament. That means, you know, set apart, something set apart, that rendered the intangible tangible through the daily rituals of dining. Now think of this, think of this. They thought about what they were dining, chores, they were all, they were all rituals. They were things that they did with thought. They weren't just things that you just kind of uh, routinely did without any idea of its meaning. And this is powerful and leisure. So she's going to, in one of these chapters, discuss their leisure. What did they do during their leisure, their time off? In fact, the Victorians often resorted to religious metaphors to describe its significance. For instance, one of the most famous theologians of his time, now see this is where I don't have much faith in these theologians or or people that uh, wrote these books, but You know, when you're researching the Victorian era, sometimes you can't find a lot by the ordinary people. He said, Home and religion are kindred words, names both of love and reverence. Home because it is the seat of religion, and religion because it is the sacred element of home. It'd take me a long time to figure out what he just said. So uh, religion and home just interposed. It wasn't only theologians who talked this way. Julia Ward Howe, and see all these people were related in some way to publishing companies, which is sad because they were the only ones that can get their books published. However, people are digging up more of the ordinary people and their publications and their poetry and their art, which is wonderful. It's all coming to light. She enjoined her audience to revere the religion of the home. They hoped their readers would cultivate that most sacred flame, the fire of domestic love. Even this wasn't enough uh, to, for the marriage advisor, Henry C. Wright, whoever he was, who ranked the home above religion as the centerpiece of human existence. And really, that makes a lot of sense because the home was created by God first. Remember Adam and Eve and their children? Uh, before before the church even came along. And so they embodied all the, and they had to teach their children their values. Compared to the home's power over the organization, character, and destiny of human beings, he wrote, the church is nothing, the state is nothing, the government, the priests, and politics are nothing. Such accolades may sound excessive or even comical to our own domestically challenged sensibilities, but they represent far more than the Victorian penchant for flowery language. And I'm going to read to you um, about the language of flowers because I mentioned flowers last time. I wanted to delve a little bit more into it. Home was a passion. You lived daily. You see, how can we even understand that? We can hardly understand it because... Some of us have only gotten as far as the house, (laughs) and we're learning to housekeep and and make our homes into homey places, but it went far deeper back in those days. 
and I believe that the only way we can bring it back is to keep our families around us and not be siphoned off in this direction and that direction and also to if possible to have uh, family businesses and to go back and learn a little bit about Jane Austen because she said far more than we realize. Now Mr. Brian Kozlowski he wrote about her references to health and so he wrote a book called The Jane Austen Diet which I have often referred to but I have been asking people that I know to write to me about why they like Jane Austen and many of them mention the home on how she gave us a glimpse into the home life and uh, so I, I want to read a little bit more about that sometime to you and someone needs to write a, a book about it um, home was a, pa a passion you lived daily as well as an ideal you sought to honor to the victorians a life worth living required just a kind of charm and home was the haven where it flourished in a way great and small at a time when the marketplace was still a man's world home provided what the physician william alcott called the blessed retreat from the turmoil of business well now of course people turn the home into business and they turn the home into politics because it's it's a very political uh contra they turn everything into controversy and i remember it when it started to come really strongly was in the 1980s i would hear things like uh well it's a real controversy if you want to stay home it's very controversial and so they turned it into something political and business everything was about business and she mentions this in this book when it gets into the 20th century she says it's all about business but I'll continue here at a time when the marketplace was still a man's world home provided what the physician William Alcock called his blessed retreat from the turmoil of business reinvigorated by this nightly respite he could return the next day to the business that paid the family's bills I believe I have some other things written by people of that era somewhere around here uh, that talks about how important a woman's role in the home was because uh, she in essence kept her husband's business many of them had their own shoe shop or their own business and uh, they needed to have her happy and not under stress because not both of them couldn't be under stress that that the home and the stability of the home required her to be there the workings of the victorian home but maintaining the home was no one-sided affair every family member was expected to contribute to creating this prized oasis to creating this prized oasis and every contribution was respected sharing the load fostered reciprocal obligations reinforcing family ties and reverence for the home that only such joint efforts could en enrich and sustain so there's a difference between the house and the home we know that the house is the structure the home is the family uh, that makes it a home but in the bible home and house were interchangeable when it would said when paul said greet greet the uh the members of the house of chloe or the house of jason or something it was interchangeable house and home were interchangeable it was where the family was wherever the family was or and the house house was also used to represent the family we we hear that sometimes one referring to uh royalty the house of was the royal family of that era or that uh country so so when they said household or house it just meant family and when he said uh, maintaining the home was no one-sided affair and every family member was expected to contribute and uh, every contribution was respected well when uh, my descendants come here I always say I remember you painted this wall when you were only 15 years old and I haven't repainted it because it I, I've treasured it so much and I just re appreciate you putting this floor in for me and then uh, another boy another one of my descendants he's really good at uh, replacing those little teeny tiny batteries uh, that takes a tiny little screwdriver and you have to undo the back of something whether it's a scale or a light or something like that he comes and he just replaces all that and gets that all fixed up for me 
and I always remember that and say something to him about it and other other kind things they have done that contributed to this home. I have another descendant that made me a, a wooden tray uh, with sides all the way around it so that I could carry things without them falling out and so everything has a meaning and when my children were growing up I wanted everything in the house to have a meaning. There was no painting or picture we hung on the wall that didn't have a message or a calming effect on someone or a meaning for some reason. I didn't want things just to match because of the color. I wanted everything to have a reason and a meaning. And you can work that out for yourself. Uh, you know, the the blanket that grandmother crocheted or one of your children crocheted and uh, an old toy that one of them played with and we can incorporate these things in the home. And that's that's why I think uh, places like Hobby Lobby are so successful is because they know this and they can really tug on your heartstrings when you go in there. Plus they have religious music, old familiar tunes playing in the background. <clears throat> it is difficult to overestimate how much the 19th century valued the skills and hearts of the women who provided the precious refuge of home. The 50s, I grew up in the 1950s, brought us the famed television show Queen for a Day. But the Victorian women were queens of the home every day, managing and overseeing the large and small details. And in a way, some of those programs uh, were actually quite revealing because they revealed that they had to be you know, you had to honor the woman and make her a queen for a day and you know, bring her flowers and things like that because she, in a way, lost her place. And a lot of things that she did were replaced by manufacturing. And a lot of the comforts that she provided were provided by some some other place. And uh, she no longer did every everything. And, uh, and I can think of some of the things we went back to just do by hand that were done for us somewhere else. And that's why I started this video out talking about uh, how we want everyone to take care of us. We want we want every aspect of our lives to be taken care of us. Well, now you can start taking charge, learn some things, take charge of your health. Keep a health diary. Write down when you feel good, when you don't feel good, what you ate, what kind of activity you had, what you were looking at, what you were listening to, who you were talking to, where you were, what the weather was like. And uh, just kind of take charge of yourself and learn a few things. Just learn how to look after yourself and and maybe take a day just to look after yourself. Domestic manuals of the period assumed the mistress of the house could master a staggering range of tasks and topics. Yes, there, there are still some books you can get and they have been reprinted. Um, there was one called The Butler's Guide to the Home, and there were others uh, for maids, but they gave us quite an insight into what had to be done. And uh, that the Victorian woman uh, wasn't necessarily a maid, but she had to do a lot of things that a maid would do if they, if they had money. Um, They had a master a staggering range of tasks and topics that would now daunt any would-be supermom. These included the basics, which are not so basic anymore, such as cooking, cleaning, showing all guests the perfection of hospitable entertainment, and tending to her children's bodies, minds, and souls. Yes, they also taught their children at home. Women were expected to serve as the family doctor and pharmacist, who dispensed home-brewed remedies without the backup help of emergency rooms and all-night drug stores. Preserving domestic health was also required a, it also required a working knowledge of ventilation and heat and lighting apparatuses. Uh, plus, you know, we were told, open a window in your house and uh, some people thought so at night. I don't think so. In extreme climates we were able to do that, but also, we kind of knew what was what was healthy for us, and it was handed down to us by the previous generation. Plus, waste disposal systems and the potentially lethal vermin that carried infectious diseases. Yeah, they knew how to get rid of mice, didn't they? 
as if her plate weren't full enough. She was the household accountant, the seamstress who made clothing. They even made uh, pants for the boys, for the men and boys. You couldn't make a pair of jeans these days, though. They're so... Uh, if you've ever been asked to mend a pair of men's jeans, they are made in such a different way by the uh, by the big machines. You can't undo them the way you would uh, if you used a pattern. If you used a pattern and cut out your own, you could undo them and, and you could also repair them. But you can't do it with the way these uh, the way these zippers and stuff uh, are put in. Uh, it's completely different then you would do it if you were making your own. It's almost impossible to hand repair them, which keeps us buying them, doesn't it? Um, so she made clothing, drapes, and linens, and the carpenter who crafted pictures and mirrors, yes, yeah, they knew how to make, uh, they actually knew how to make frames. And she had to pull all this together to what Catherine Beecher called the beautiful effect of the wise disposition of color and skill in arrangement. Above all, women were the paragons of that defining Victorian value, thrift. Frugality was highly respected as a feminine accomplishment, and a wife's ability to budget, bargain, and keep her financial house in order determined her family's fate as much as her husband's paycheck. I'm going to stop there because I'll make a few comments about that. And that is, even back in the 1950s, of course, we were children of parents that were born in the 1920s. And the women were very good at managing uh, the, the family money. And I remember uh, men asking uh, their wives, you know, I'd really like to buy a new tractor could you check and see how we're doing and tell me, is there enough in there for me to have a tractor? And they always knew every detail. They knew how to manage it. But I also remember that uh, we rarely had things like napkins and paper towels. And so every, except when we had a, uh, we were hosting something like a barbecue or a, a cookout or something like that. We always had those, but uh, they weren't everyday items and they knew how to, it wasn't that they were trying to do without, it's just that they knew how to keep the money from going out there. And they didn't, they did not think that money was for everyday things like we do today. And, but of course, they grew most of their food and they made most of their things that they needed. Now, I'm going to read uh, something here from uh, Helen Andelin's book, Fascinating Womanhood, and it's about the home. And she's talking about women at home. And this is goes along with Linda Lichter's remarks that I read to you today. She said that she's addressing the women at home. You may feel that what you are doing from day to day in the home is relatively unimportant and that men have the more important jobs. Noble contribution to mankind, you may reason, are made in the fields of science, industry, government, or the arts. I like to caution young homeschool children who are reading a lot of stories in their homeschool curriculum about famous missionaries. Uh, sadly, that gives people the idea that that's the glamorous thing to go for. But the home and staying home and being a minister, a ministry at home, a ministry of the home, making it uh, making it comfortable and beautiful and glorifying to God is really more important. And so, but she's going to get to that here. Noble contribution to mankind, you may reason, are made in the fields of science, industry, government, or the arts. Women who think this have a false notion. They exaggerate the importance of man's work and underestimate the importance of the women's work in the home. Noble as the contributions of men are, they do not surpass a well brought up family. That's a dream for many women is I want to I want to get married and have a home and raise good children and uh, have a cohesive family. A doctor spends his time saving lives. You, on the other hand, in the simple routine of your home are saving souls. 
Learn to see the distant scene. How your patient devotion to family produces men and women of worth, the greatest contribution to any society. Now, you can read that and people can say that, but you've got to be able to break that down into how you're going to get there. And the first, the first step is to be home, to be dedicated to the home, make a list of how you're going to make it run nicely. It will eventually come to you. It will eventually settle into this wonderful culture and of values that you have been looking for. I'm going to read a little bit more of my of my notes here. So many of the people that I talk to about um, Jane Austen wanted to tell me that she brought into our existence the value of the the manners and the life at home and the, how a family worked and one of my dear friends that called me she said that uh, they were multi-generational this is what Linda Lichter was trying to explain in her book about Victorian times but Jane Austen was before Victorian times and she was they were Regency around the time she was born around the time uh, of the American um, 1776 uh, when the U.S. was established and so she mentioned that they were multi-generational and they had long conversations in their homes about about the choice of mates, choice of husbands because it would have an impact on their parents and their their family um, their family story, their family history and so they would discuss uh, and warn, have and listen to warnings about the reputations of these men, and uh, so they they were very careful because it also meant something to do with the future. It would affect their children. It would affect their grandchildren. And I don't know if people think about that as much today. Now, if you've made mistakes in the past, you do have a perfect right to. Uh, warn people. A lot of people will say, "Oh, you did such and such in the past, and now you're you're married and you have a home and everything. You're a hypocrite because uh, you didn't you didn't really live that great life beforehand." But that's not what it's all about. It's all about getting on the right track. And once you do, then you're obligated to warn and help others to go that way and restore the 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 beauty and the stability of home life. And to uh, one of the things that somebody brought up when they were talking about why they liked Jane Austen is because she recognized that they were felt obligated to leave a goodly heritage. In other words, leave a, a history, uh, something that future generations could look back on and talk about and be proud of. Don't you wish? Sometimes I find myself, even around here at the manse, wishing that I knew uh, more about the Victorian ladies because I see their houses uh, all around me in these little country towns there will be an old Victorian house here and there and I'll wonder what they did all day long and what did they do especially in the winter in these gloomy overcast days what kind of life did they have and I suppose because I was reading in Linda Lichter's book how they had it all divided up into rituals and very important things they did, I'm sure, that they stopped to have tea, that they stopped to read a book, that they stopped to write a letter, that they uh, that they uh, wrote a letter, but they could read a letter. Sometimes when letters came to me um, when my children were growing up, I'd read them aloud to my children so they would understand the importance of a letter. Uh, and I'm sure that they kept busy because the generation before them did it and they knew how. Well now you're coming out of an institution, you're coming out of a graduated from something or you've been working in a workplace and that all of your day is laid out for you in chunks of hours and so you come home now what do you do? So that's why you have to learn about the past, you have to learn what did they do and of course we live in a different type of world and we'll just have to learn how we can adjust our day and our lives to it and everybody has a home or a place to dwell that they have to manage and that's important that's why I say get yourself at least ready and start writing a list of what 
what you can do. And even if you don't get anything done, somehow writing these things uh, balance your mind, makes you more keen. So here is the uh, Jane Austen's world.com, which I often uh, refer to, uh, about... Um, about introductions, I had read that to you before about introductions and how important it was. And so here it is. Among the gentry in the country, when someone moved into a neighborhood, it was polite for his neighbor to call on him. Okay. Uh, and and you see that in uh, Pride and Prejudice. You know, uh, oh, Mr. Bennett, I don't know if you're going to call on him or not. Um, Obviously, Mr. Bennett must introduce himself so that his daughters can meet Mr. Bingley. However, there's another reason for Ms. Mrs. Bennett's insistence. Once the call has been made, it must be returned. When you went to see somebody, uh, and you, if you remember uh, in North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell, uh, the story about the cotton mills, you know, and uh, Mrs. Thornton, uh, Mr. Thornton's mother, came to see, um, goodness, what was her name? <laughs> I'm thinking it's it's Margaret, but she came to see Margaret and her family and uh, called on them uh, because that was what they did. She said, I, I will call on them. They were new to the area and it was just done. That was just done. So she was obligated and she was also the mother of a very successful manufacturer and it was just kind of a society thing to do. So she was calling on them. She went to see them. They offered her a cup of tea and uh, she said, I will expect you to come to tea next week. So once the call was made, it had to be returned. I love that, don't you? Virtually all visits required a reciprocal visit so that once one started visiting at a particular house, it was hard to stop. This bit of information makes Mrs. Bennett's shrewd scheme and even more humorous, for she knows it will inevitably lead to her daughter's being introduced to Mr. Bingley. So, uh, that was just an interesting thing to do, and, I, and, and included in most Victorian ladies' life was calling on someone. but. In doing so, I think it was just a kind of a, a signal, you know, just something that they had to do. And I wanted to tell you about that because uh, you can't call on anybody today. I'm a preacher's wife of 50 years, and that stopped a whole lot long ago. It's very hard. Uh, a lot of women are working. They're not home during the day. I don't like to go out by myself. It's not safe. Um, and it's just not the same as it, as it used to be. But my mother-in-law, she would, she could every, she had one day a week that she'd go calling and she'd get in her car and she'd make all her calls. <laughs> uh, so, but you know, it was just a different kind of world then. So another uh, thing before I go today, I wanted to talk to the young people, or, and even you, if uh, if you're thinking you need to do some kind of extra work that that's not homemaking, there are a couple of things I often wonder why the young girls in homeschool don't ever choose to do, but they are they can create wonderful ministries, and one was the florist thing, which I spoke about in my previous video, how important florals are and how important fresh things are and fresh flowers to grow them and to uh, make a bouquet out of them and to take them to someone or you know have them sent to someone uh, by someone else and why they're not trying to do that and the other one would be uh, food preparation why uh, aren't they taking classes in cooking or classes in different things kind of to do with food and uh, you know, taking homemaking classes, how to, you know, make a bed, how to choose linens, how to choose um, healthy, healthy things for the home. And, uh, but instead, I find many young girls, of course, many people uh, watch, it depends on what kind of influences they have. And uh, they want to be something that is almost impossible to be. 
and would take them uh, far away from their home and separate them from their families. But these are just a couple of things you, you might consider. And if you're listening here and you're young and you are at home. Well, ladies, I have... Oh, I was going to read to you about the flowers. Yes, because I mentioned that they used to kind of have a language or a symbolism to them. And so I'll read to you from the language of flowers. Uh, I've lost this. Somebody took the cover off of this. So, By Barbara Milo Orbach. So, the language of flowers. The language of flowers, oriental in origin, that's interesting, was introduced to England by Lady Mary Wortley Montagu in the mid-18th century. In her letters from Constantinople, where her husband was ambassador, she wrote that there is no color, no flower, no weed, no fruit, herb, pebble, or feather that has not got a verse belonging to it. You may send letters of passion, friendship, and civility without inking your fingers. That's interesting, isn't it? And it just reminds me of um, my little boy bringing me a little rock that had a shape to it, and he thought it was pretty. Or... Um, some colored leaf or something like that. There was more in that than a kiss. Just beautiful. The language of flowers, most popular in Europe, evolved into a list of sentimental meanings and thoughts in which each flower had a particular meaning. And for example, a nosegay composed of, a nosegay is just a little bunch of flowers composed of globe amaranth meant unfading love bluebell constancy clover be mine and roses love would be an affectionate gift of flowers indeed so if you like this idea as much as i do find yourself a piece of lovely old ribbon go into the garden and make a special bouquet for someone you care about now i i have flowers around the perimeter of the house of the manse here and my least, I have to say this, you won't like me for saying it, but I don't like the, I le least like the rose. I don't like it. It's persnickety. It, it can uh, cut me and stab me when I least expect it when I'm going around some other plants. And unfortunately, someone planted uh, some here and you can never ever uh, remove them and put them somewhere else. You, you can, and they'll grow somewhere else. But there's always a root there that always comes back. I've never figured out how how not to get them to come back. But uh, they, they're just a, my, my least favorite because they're not as easy to look after compared to the daisy and other things. So I will uh, just read the A's for flowers and their meanings here. And we'll do more of that later, okay? Acacia pink means elegance. Flowering almond means hope. Uh, amaryllis is pride, ambrosia, love returned, um, angelica, inspiration, apple blossom, preference, uh, azalea, temperance. So those were just, you know, those were just interesting. But I think today anything that you can bundle up and give to somebody was, is an absolute delight. And I want to read a poem. Uh, this book was full of little old-fashioned pictures and poems from back then, Victorian times. So I want to read a little saying here. I do not want change. I want the same old and loved things, the same trees and soft ash green, the turtle doves, the blackbirds, the colored yellow hammer sing, sing, singing so long as there is light to cast a shadow on the dial. That'd be the, uh, the, t the time dial. For such is the measure of his song. I want them in the same place. And here's a little poem in this book, The Language of Flowers. I've often wished that I had clear for life 600 pounds a year, a handsome house to lodge a friend, a river at my garden's inn, a terrace walk and half a road of land set out to plant a wood. Okay, ladies, I hope that you got a few things done while you listened today and that some of what I said was valuable to you. Remember, just check it out. 
I could have made some uh, some mistakes. If we were sitting here talking, uh, you would probably filter out most of what I said, but it was just for your entertainment. And if anyone gets too serious about it, remember it was just the rantings of an old woman. So I hope you uh, have a lovely day today. Keep close to Christ, and I'll talk to you later. Bye.